Hello motorsport fans, don't forget to subscribe, turn on your notifications and like this video so we can keep the channel going. Tantri Moksani Tun Mahathir, President of the Motorsport Association of Malaysia. Good morning and welcome to the show. Thank you, Ben. It's uh, good to be here. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Uh, yes, I've been wanting to get someone from the Malaysian Motorsport Association for some time. Um, I, I wanted to start off with getting to know how you got involved in in motorsport. What was your interest? How you how you got started? Because you you used to race, I believe. Yes, I used to. But you know, I, I've been a guy who's always been uh, passionate about cars, automobiles, and and automobile technology. And for the longest of time, I was hanging around uh, Batu Tiga, watching races, uh, and got involved in motorsports, especially when Sepang Circuit was built. So back in the day, in the year 2000, we did the Merdeka Millennium Endu Endurance Race with a couple of friends. And um, I got hooked ever since. So went from one thing to the other, um, joined the Sepang International Circuit Board, ended up as chairman later on. And uh, here I am today, um, being part of the regulatory body over motorsports in Malaysia. So uh, yeah, I've been involved in motorsports, cars, and for the longest of time, more than 20 years. Wow, wow. And as the president of, I mean, the Motorsport Association of Malaysia is the national ASN. Yes. Um, it's responsible for the MotoGP, and if we do get Formula One back. Uh, as the president, what are your roles and responsibilities in that position? Well, right now it's a, a regulatory function to make sure motorsports is um, conducted in Malaysia safely according to international regulations, whether it is the driver, the teams, the circuits, and and as governing body, we just have to make sure you know everything is done properly. So that's our main function. And of course, uh, we're also looking at mobility. We're also looking at... Um, road safety um, because you know FIA and FIM doesn't just look at motorsports they want to make sure road users the general public um, are safe when they when they use um, on they when they're on roads no matter what they're riding or driving so that's the other function that motorsports association of Malaysia has which we will now have to ramp up yeah that's um that's an interesting point that's certainly something a lot of motorsport fans wouldn't realize actually I, I i just realized it myself um and yeah i think doing something to educate the public road users uh is something definitely that needs to happen here in malaysia oh yeah uh so were you are you guys planning on implementing some kind of um like a defensive driving course or something like that I think we have a very good working relationship with our stakeholders, especially Sepang International Circuit. And, uh, you know, they've got programs, they've got uh, academies that are coming up. Work, we are working with them uh, to open up the performance center so that people can come and, and understand uh, what performance driving is, what um, good driving is. Actually, we've lost sight of that over, over the years. So if you think about the pyramid of uh, how many people are on the roads and then that 1.0001% who are actually in motorsports, we have to take care of the larger um, piece of that, that pyramid, which is the road user. And as you correctly pointed out, Ben, I mean, there's a lot of things in, in the attitude and the culture of driving, be it whether it's in Malaysia or anywhere else, there's always room for improvement. So you'll read in newspapers every day about how many accidents there are, fatalities and injuries. And that's something that the motor sports community can come back and help with because a lot of the people in motorsports are icons for many of the road users, especially the younger generation. So we have to come back and, and give back to them. Yeah, true. The The performance center is, I mean, that that was the one that was recently launched a couple of months ago. Yes, it was by our Minister of Youth and Sports. Okay, and is that um, 
part of i remember a few years back when sapang were resurfacing and and uh rebuilding the grandstands they're going yes. to put uh, some tarmac i think around or inside of turn three and turn four for some uh driving courses or something is that part of the performance center i don't think it's going to be inside the main uh, circuit it's going to be outside but you know we i think sapang is is rebuilding a lot of its facilities whether it's the go-kart track and everything else so it's going to be able to cater for a different segment of of the market of people who are interested in not so much as competitive racing but improving their skills in in driving so you know we want to attract as many people into motorsports by virtue of them being able to associate themselves with uh, a, a motorsports facility like sapang and sapang is a world-class facility so there is an attraction general attraction for people to come to sapang yeah true true and there's also the talent academy yes that, uh, i'm not sure if that's officially launched yet um but that's can you can you touch on what the MAM Talent Academy is is about? Well, whether it is two wheel or four wheel, we have to go down to grassroots levels to try and uh, nurture the young, very young generation to understand what motorsports is all about. It's not just jumping up onto a motorbike or a go kart and then just driving it, driving the wheels off of it. There's a lot of discipline involved, a lot of training, and we want to get. Uh, kids to understand what it takes to become a, a Lewis Hamilton or, or Max Verstappen. So it is, um, it's a journey. So what we in MEM are trying to do is to educate the general public to understand that it's not by chance that these people are where they are in Formula One or in MotoGP. It is by design. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of organization. And of course, it's a lot of support. Uh, from parents, from sponsors, from the funding that's required. So we need to have things like that. Those facilities in Malaysia, the last two years has been very challenging for many of us, for all of us. We did not see much motorsports at all other than what you see on screen, e-racing e and all of that, sim, sim racing. So we need to go back and, and get people into tracks, into carts, into motorbikes to get um, that talent uh identified supported nurtured and hopefully one day we'll have champions again and the talent isn't just driving or riding is it it's um marshals uh even uh down to the business aspect of motorsport as of well course. you know yeah because you know people always you know we've had this thing about motorsports and people think it's just sports it's actually a big business in itself so you know it, it trickles down from the teams to the sponsors to the facilities to the people that need to be to be at the facilities for riders and drivers to race safely so that means training of marshals training of officials you know whether it's the clerk of the course the stewards um, everybody so it's actually big business in terms of whether you're a circuit owner you're a team owner or a driver because you're having to engage with a lot of stakeholders so MEM, we are we have been working with the FIA, whether it is um, the HQ or or regional, to host uh, training courses for marshals, training courses for stewards. We will also be sending these people to other races for them to to experience it live, to be part of it live, for them to gain that valuable experience, for them to come back to work in whether it is Sapan circuit or the other smaller circuits around the country. Is is the sports ministry behind this, and have they recognised motorsport as a profession? Because I remember um, when I was running a motorsport marketing business, uh, that was one of the frustrations: was that the government didn't see motorsport or racing drivers as a proper profession. Uh, has has that changed in any way? Well, it's changed somewhat in the last couple of years because now, like for instance, Sepang International Circuit has uh, has come under the purview of Ministry of Youth and Sports. So now we have a ministry that is looking at what happens uh, in SIC and, and SIC being the biggest venue for motorsports in Malaysia, uh, you know, there is more interest 
um, we, uh, Ministry of Youth and Sports. Uh, this Minister of, of Youth and Sports is actively engaged in promoting motorsports. And they're also making sure that everything is done safely. So that's where MEM comes in. So the, it's a tripartite uh, working arrangement between Ministry of Youth and Sports, SIC and MEM to make sure we can develop motorsports. And it seems to be working. Previously, we may or may not have um, an umbrella ministry to take care of what was happening at SIC because we did have several big events. So it was the we were split between... The benefits were split between youth and sports, Ministry of Tourism, because the number of tourists who come in for all these big events is very, very big. Yeah. And the economic impact is, is significant. Yeah, the, the Tourism Board of Malaysia have always been great with their support. Yes. Even for the smaller grassroots events, uh, it was always quite easy to get financial support from Tourism Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose now since we've had the two-year lockdown now is a kind of completely new reset button yes. and it's very necessary for for us to attract uh tourists over here um so hopefully tourism malaysia will, will stay strong within the sport but um talking about the big events uh do you see the lack of formula one and the fact that really the only major international event that malaysia has at the moment is still only moto gp do you see that as a, a negative effect on what the mam is trying to achieve with developing the industry well uh, now you know formula one if if anybody's been following it recently realized that they've got a new audience and a lot of it is because of programs like Drive to Survive on Netflix, right? So it's a different different beast compared to when we gave it up in 2017, I think was our last race. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is Formula One is expensive. Uh, it's expensive and, you know, it's it's um, the payment terms are in US dollar. So maybe right now um, with the ringgit where it is, it is going to be a bit too expensive for us to subscribe to but of course it, it would be fantastic if we could bring it bring it back in um the tourism impact that a formula one or even of course a motor gp would have on on the tourism economy of the country is is significant but motor gp is more of a regional we have a regional audience which we have done well with and motor gp for now is only in uh, indonesia in lombok and in australia and uh, I'm not sure whether Thailand is, is starting, restarting it or if they have. But, you know, we have a big market for MotoGP as compared to Formula One. And if you look at the return, return on investment between the two, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a given that MotoGP is going to come up trumps. So I hope um, that we will continue with that, MotoGP. And the opportunity for us to put riders in Moto3 and Moto2, which comes as a package deal, with mm. MotoGP is always a, a plus point. Yeah, exactly. I, I, you, you're actually making money with MotoGP, unlike Formula One when Bernie was running it. Uh, he was <laughs> taking everything. Really, wasn't there? There was there was really no revenue to to cover the costs of running Formula well, One. I, I'm not going to touch on that too much. But like I said, it's completely different right now. What uh, Liberty Media has done with with uh, Formula One, it's reached out uh, to a new audience. And I've never seen so many younger kids know the personalities within Formula One so so well. They can speak about everything. They can talk about Max, Lando Norris, the rivalry between team drivers, the team principals. I've never seen this, um, this before. Last time... Uh, People who are diehard Formula One fans are people of my age because mm. we've grown up with it since, you know, the 70s, 80s and 90s. Yes, I'm that old. So this new generation of Formula One fans is amazing because it's in a way turned uh, into a bit of a reality TV show. Mm. That's right. There was. It's fantastic how they've embraced social media and an online mm -hmm. presence and uh, David Soninsher and I touched on it during his his time on the podcast where Bernie Bernie always avoided that aspect 
he he didn't understand that social media that could do wonderful things and well liberty media have hollywoodized a lot of their major yes. sports in america and uh even just the new graphics that they're showing uh yes fantastic did you did you see the hungarian grand prix last night yes um i did and you know ferrari gave it up and it's amazing for max verstappen to go from 10th to first and i'm so so happy to see of course to see the the mercedes petronas uh, team take uh, second and third so they're back on on the top steps almost mm. so we'll see where they go for once they come back from the summer break yeah exactly ferrari just threw it away i mean going they moving on to hard tires it's like yeah they the have a great car yeah they have a great car somehow they just ha something's missing so i don't know what it is yeah true and i suppose in regards to moto gp helping uh local motorsports uh, i think a, a, a key ingredient to that is what raslan's doing yes uh, with his moto gp team there um is the mam will you guys be teaming up with with raslan's team and maybe using that as a platform to develop local talent well, you know, uh, Razlan is focusing on MotoGP, and what we need to do is to in improve grassroots support for for two wheels. So they will probably be looking at Moto3 and Moto2. Uh, so to make sure that that feeder series um, is healthy, it has the kind of participation and exposure that we want in Malaysia. And of course, you know, you you look about uh, you look at funding for it. So we just need to keep eyes on moto 3 and moto 2 as much as we we need uh, for moto gp but you know without grassroots support we're never going to find a, a malaysian rider in moto gp in years to come is the shell advanced talent cup is that still happening is, is that going to be relaunched I, do you know i believe it's still it's going to come back because it's, it was a successful program when it was running at full steam mm. and you know they they developed not only uh, talent in driving, but uh, the participants were also taught how to present themselves, how to speak when a microphone is trust in, trust in front of you, yeah. uh, and that worked well. So, it, you know, for, for sponsors, that's very important, right? Not only do you end up uh, on the podium somewhere, but to be able to present yourself and your sponsors properly uh, when, you need, when you're given an opportunity to speak exactly exactly media training is just important as what you do on the circuit yes um do you do you think that having one circuit sapang is is somewhat i don't want to say detrimental but i mean that local motorsport could definitely be stronger if there was more than one circuit wouldn't it of course uh we you know a lot of states have been talking about building um, circuits around the country but somehow it's been left to the uh, private enterprise to build the circuits um, we have we we know there's pasi gudang uh, yeah. which with with some money probably can come back as as a great venue as how it used to be back in the day the circuit in Kedah is supposed to come up but but seem to have uh, stalled yeah what happened to that because I remember the launch. There was a big launch for it. It looked fantastic. Yes, and I think uh, Sapan Circuit was an advisor to what, what should be done there. Mm. And then there's talk about things in Langkawi that hasn't really materialized. So there's all of this talk. So, so far, you know, it is the private enterprise that have come up with smaller circuits where you, you can have um, small motorbike races. Mm. Um, so the Cup Prix and all of this are... are uh, hosted at smaller circuits, but they are safe. They are certified certified circuits for safety, so that's very important for us. And you you keep that at least one um, series going uh, active and and safely. So, but we still need we you know it would be great if we have one more up north. The Pasir Gudang circuit is is um, refurbished and back in in action, and then uh, in probably East Malaysia yeah the i think there needs to be more education with these private enterprises because when you mention motorsport and this is a problem i've seen with with 
some local motorsport personalities who have the land or they have access to the land, but the owners, the private enterprises have this image in their head, this perception that because it's motorsport, that it should be a multi-million dollar, multi-million ringgit business, but it's not necessarily the case owning a smaller grassroots circuit. I mean, we just want a piece of tarmac to go racing and yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be, you're not going to become a multi multi-millionaire having a circuit. Well, you know, to me, cheap and cheerful works as long as it's safe. Right. And, and, and going back to the point that you said, whether or not having SIC, uh, that one circuit is detrimental. If, if it, Sepang the national circuit is a world-class facility designed for formula one from the onset. When it was the, when we went into Formula One in '96 and then had the first race in '99, that was a purpose-built circuit for Formula One and then of course MotoGP. Nobody else can do something like that as today, especially uh, you know if you talk about cost escalation and everything else. So around the country, what we need is what you just said. You know, big piece uh, a piece of land with the right tarmac properly designed for motorsports safe, safely and, and, you know, with simple uh, steps for people to, to sit on to, to watch racing. Mm-hmm. It's cheap and cheerful. It'll work. And there is money to be made in, in this kind of uh, facility. Is You just need to be focused and understand what the needs are and cater to it. Yeah, true. I mean, there's a lot of local motorsport groups, associations, clubs, that can be putting on great events, but mm. Sapang is just I mean, renting Sapang is just out of their capability. Um, and yeah, I think Sapang has basically rented out 340 odd days a year. Um, well, well, you, well, you're correct, Ben. I mean, it is, uh, you know, it's busy in Sapang and it's expensive, but. If you think about the the, um, the foreign market, which they also cater to, Sepang International Circuit looks like a great deal. Hmm. Yeah, true, true. Uh, what are, besides the lack of circuits, are there any other issues that the MAM or yourself see within uh, not just Malaysian motorsport, but the Asian motorsport industry? I, I think I think it's a matter of just you know training people to to man the the facilities that where these events are, are hosted to make sure things can can be done safely. Um, I think that's going to be a key moving forward. In the last two years, when we didn't have any events, we probably lost people to the other industries or just people just retired out of motorsports. Now to try and ramp that back up to where we we would want it to be prior to COVID-19, it's going to take a bit of time. But I must say the cooperation with that we or the support we're getting from FIA and FIM to do this via online courses and now physical meetings uh, will get us there. Hopefully, within the next uh, six to twelve months, we'll 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 ramp back up to pre-20 uh, COVID days. Yeah. Um... Well, speaking of events uh, and something you were involved in is the the old Medeca race or the Sepang 12 hour. Uh, are we are we ever going to see that again? I mean, that was that was a huge event. It kind of it, it went up. I, I remember uh, several years back, there were grids of 50, 60 <laughs> cars uh, and it had a bit of a slump. And then SRO took it over and was bringing yes. it back. And then it kind of fallen flat again well it's a question whether you want a domestic national race or you want an international race right so uh i think the Merdeka millennium endurance race is how it first started and why i got into competitive uh, motorsports um is it it was so successful it became more and more successful that you had bigger teams, faster cars, and then it became it went from an amateur race to a pro am, and it became pro uh, until it kind of like priced itself out of the the local market. So once you don't have local participation, I guess the interest drops off. 
but then that you know from from that we we created the sepang 1000 uh, which is very successful the whether it is you're driving a proton or a honda the the support for that event is is quite quite uh interesting and i'm seeing you know kids children of of the drivers who used to drive in the Madeka race now racing in s1k so that's the kind of race uh, racing that we want to see uh, help promote talent uh, in Malaysia and in the region. And I'm quite sure the the bigger GT3 races will come back, and you know our kids will graduate into that that kind of series. But it's it's a cost factor. Back in the day, you had you could buy a, a GT3 car for maybe a fraction, a 25% of what is a competitive GT3 car today. So mm -hmm. it's all of that is now is now a factor. But S1K and and races similar to it, the Malaysian Championship Series, are doing well to to support uh, talent development, team development, and of course all the marshals and stewards around circuit for them to to get hands on experience. And I hope it, you know it continues. It has to be supported. True, and there needs to be there needs to be an increased involvement in exposing these events as well um i mean is, is that something that mam is is putting some focus on as well i mean it's great that the talent development academy is is coming up and the performance driving academy but uh, is the mam doing anything to increase exposure of the industry well we we are at every launch and and coverage of these events we try and encourage the media to get involved. Uh, in fact, in some in some instances, we tell them to participate to get a first-hand uh, experience of what it is from inside the car rather than from just outside. Mm -hmm. So we're doing things like that, um, and then get them. You know, we need uh, media support in everything we do, uh, so that people outside uh, the motorsports uh, industry can understand what is happening at. at events at Sepang the National Circuit and uh, else, elsewhere within the country. So it's not just small it's not just small events because events like this also attract families and then friends and fans. So the knock-on effect, the domino impact of, of effect of, of all this is quite big. So mm -hmm. we need support of the media uh, to make sure these the events are, are covered. For MAM, we are touching base with the media to make sure that they understand and they, they know what the schedule is for, for motorsports in Malaysia. Yeah, the, I mean, more more television exposure yes. would, would do wonders. And that's always been a the crux of, of the sport, really. Because um, I remember events that we would do, getting, getting the TV three cameras down there yeah. it is just so damn expensive yes um, i mean if mam or sic could invest in their own production. cameras and production setup i know but ben the fact that we're doing this online right you're using google chrome and social media mm -hmm. i think that's the way to go the popularity uh, or you know eyes on screen today is not tv anymore yeah. it's computers, it's laptops, it's your mobile phone. So, you know, we have to be clever in how we use social media to, to spread to spread the word. Yeah, and that's uh, another great new aspect that Formula One's brought into it is, is yeah. using YouTube and giving us five to 10 minute highlights because you, know, you don't need to watch the whole race these days. Just get onto no. social media in your own time and you've got the whole story within five minutes. You know, you, and you're right, because if you look at, even now at, at races where people physically attend, the number of people attending is higher than pre-2019 mm -hmm. or even before Liberty Media came up with, you know, net, with Netflix to drive, to survive and putting things on social media. So you have a bigger audience that, yes, they see it on screen, but one day they they do want to come to the track to see what it really looks like, how that that TV experience or that social media experience translates into um, reality, or mm -hmm. the other way around, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
the I, I want to touch on women in motorsport actually uh, because uh, the MAM the the CEO of the Motorsport Association of Malaysia is Shamila. Yes. Um, and she used to be the COO of the Sepang circuit. And I, from my research, well, definitely in Asia, she's the only woman that holds such a high position in the industry. Um, and I think from, from the international, other international ASNs, I haven't really seen uh, any of them having a, a woman in such a high position. Um, is, is, is this an important part that MAM is focusing? Cause it's not only Shamila, there's, there's a lot of other staff members, mm -hmm. uh, involved with the MAM, uh, who are women, but is there any like focused program or, or, or something like that from, from the MAM to encourage more women to get involved? Well, FIA has been talking about diversity um for the longest of time uh, shamila fits the bill her credentials are top notch she's been involved in motorsports for the longest of time via sic um she was also involved in uh, vietnam uh, when she came back because uh, vietnam you know couldn't host the f1 so i saw that as an opportunity to put her back into malaysian motorsports and i'm glad that she took up the job so from that, that perspective, um, yeah, but it was purely on merit, not just because she's a, she's a, a woman. But, you know, we, we also have to look at all sorts of other things uh, that, that we're trying to promote. Uh, officials at tracks, um, all of that, we're looking for um, a diversity, women. To, to get involved in motorsports. There are a few ladies who have been racing um, and then, of course, uh, we have a drift queen in Leona Chin, and we have other racing uh, girls in racing. So we want to promote all of that and to make sure that they are properly supported so that they can enjoy a certain level of success. FIA has got you know its own series in, for women's racing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing in MCS, we have lead women drivers, of course, in, in karting also. Yeah. So, yeah, so we, we're going to keep an eye on this to make sure they are properly uh, represented and presented. Yeah, I actually have Anne Bradshaw uh, coming onto the podcast later this week, um, a very prominent woman from Formula One and uh, mm. the W Series, uh, the new W Series. So, um, yeah, we'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, you, you've mentioned the FIA a few times and... It reminds me that the, a couple of the team owners and other Malaysian motorsport uh, figures I've had on the podcast, in terms of the promotion of Asian motorsport, the, the common theme seems to be that the FIA is not doing as much as they could possibly in terms of uh, promoting Asia more or uh, getting involved to support Asia. Um, you being on, on the inside and you're, you're, you're very close to the FIA, of course. Is there something, well, uh, is that your view? Do you think FIA could be doing more in regards to supporting Asian motorsport? I don't think there is a bias um, for and against Asia motorsports or compared to other regions of the world. Um, I think there's, of course, there's always more that can be done. And if you think about how many uh, major events are in Asia, you know, you talk about Formula One, you have China, you have uh, Singapore, uh, you have Australia, which also part of this region. Um, and then now you have MotoGP in, in uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and, and other Asian countries. There's a, there should be a lot more focus on the development of motorsports in this region. And then if you look at the population base, we are a relatively young market, right? The representation of top level uh, motorsports participants is still lacking. We are investing in it in the sense of, if you look at companies that are involved in, in motorsports, whether it's two or four wheel, you'll see names pop up. But in terms of drivers and riders, at the top 
most level of motorsports that's still yet to to be seen so yes fia and fim can look at asia in a different light or you know to 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 do more but it's also you know part of what we should do as as motorsports asia to to push our agenda forward so we've seen a, a, a change recently uh, with Sheikh Mohammed Sulaim as, as the FIA mm -hmm. uh, new president. So we are talking to him to make sure that he sees Asia in a different light and to see that, you know, the, the amount of talent that is here, the population base of whole of Asia, uh, the amount of money that companies are putting into motorsports, uh, not just here and globally, you know, we can do more. There's a lot that they can do more with us and we can do more with them. Yeah, and I think um, uh, Lung, Neon Lung, um, yeah. who was the, the the president of the Singapore Motorsports Association, yes. uh, he's recently become the Asia. FIA vice president yes. of Asia or something like that. Yes. And we are you working closely with him? Of course. <laughs> he's a, he's he knows Malaysia very well, of course, and he's a. He's always at the Sepang Go Kart track uh, mm -hmm. racing, so he's you know a blue blood race driver and understands uh, motorsports in in Malaysia, Singapore, and in Asia in general. And I'm I'm happy that he's uh, he is recognized by the FIA for what he has been doing in the past and mm -hmm. will be doing in the future. So you know we need to highlight a lot of things that is happening in Asia uh, that benefits both Asia and the FIA in general. Yeah, it does make a difference when the high positions are filled with people who are racers. Oh, uh, yes. They're either racing or have raced or racers at heart. Yes. Um, same with uh, Tantri Asman Yaya becoming chairman of Sapang yeah. Circuit. Uh, I remember when he, he became chairman, immediately he was making the right changes and improvements uh, because he had the – he knew it. He, he was a driver. He was a racer. Yeah. So he knows it. Um, and yeah, there was a time both in Malaysian motorsport and Singapore motorsport where the top positions were businessmen uh, who weren't experienced in racing, um, always looking for the financial return. But no, it's great to see that the high top positions are, are being filled with actual racers. Um, but I guess, I guess you know, in any sports association, it always helps to have somebody who has been on the other side of the table, right? You come up as a participant and then you go through, you go up the ranks, whether you learn about the organization the, and the association to, to successfully be part, contribute back to, to the sports that you love uh in in promoting it so whether it's long whether it's myself or in, in azman yahya and there's so many in in different countries uh around here where people who have been racist who have come back to to contribute so uh, that's what we're doing and hopefully we'll be able to do it well because we know what is required to make it successful yeah now you 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 touched just a couple of minutes ago on on the companies uh and other entities being involved in local motorsport Besides Formula One and Mercedes, is Petronas actually involved in local motorsport in some capacity behind the scenes? I would like to think that they are. And in fact, that I, be, I believe they're taking on MotoGP from now on. All right. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, um, that's a big ticket item that they're taking on. So I'm, I'm happy that they've, they're they're training their eyes on it and i'm sure they they would be looking at probably the the smaller series three and two mm. to make sure uh local talent get an opportunity to graduate to the bigger to the bigger series so and then there's a lot of you know we've seen companies like xox Brahat, uh sponsor teams uh we've seen so many i mean if you if you go to a two-wheel um, event at Sepan Circuit, you will see brands and sponsors on motorbikes um, that you know you you would have to you have to raise your hat to them for keep keeping those kids uh, on the bikes. Uh, 
Hmm. So, yeah, so there is a lot of support. We just need to make sure it, it continues, give them the media coverage and that exposure that makes it worthwhile for them. Is the, I've always wondered that, I mean, the Sapang circuit is owned by the Ministry of Finance, right? Yes. And is that, do you see that as a positive uh, for local motorsport or over, being privately owned by racing people? Is there kind of, is, is the ownership of the Ministry of Finance more focused towards making a return on investment rather than developing the actual sport? Because that's that's a point of view that some of the, the, the grassroots promoters see it as. Well, I, I, to me, of course, if you want to just develop motorsports, like I said, going back to something that's cheap and cheerful will also do the job. If you want to, to race at, you know, a palace of motorsports, that's what you get in Sepang International Circuit. That is, like I said, a, a, a world-class facility. It is second to none. You can go to even other motorsports venues that would lose out to, to Sepang International Circuit. So it comes at a cost. So that's why most of the big events, if not all, are held at Sepang International Circuit if you want to cater for 60,000, 100,000 people and you want to have a global audience looking at how the races are conducted in safe, uh, safely and, and with the kind of crowd that, that, that will be there to, to support it. So there's there's no there's no loss to the motorsports community, but the fact that MOF is holding it, and MOF holding it is probably the, the right um, entity because they can hold it. Otherwise, somebody a businessman who would have to pay um, whatever it costs back then to build a circuit, the land and everything, will be looking at at a return and a profit from the operations of Sepang International Circuit. I'm not saying that MOF can write it off. They're not, but at least they're just looking at, um, um, you know, to break even on the on the running of Sepang Circuit. So that's, that's important. But like I said, cheap and cheerful circuits around the country, a grade two circuit instead of, of uh, tier one uh, would do just, just as well. So, Private entities, local companies should be looking at that just as much as they're looking at Sepang, racing at Sepang International Circuit. Hmm. And if, if someone has access to land, but not the financing to build a circuit, would the MAM be the first stop to, to discuss such an opportunity? We would we would step in to assist in the technical side, advisory side of what it would take to make something a venture like that successful. But you know, it, it, you have to be very clear cut that it's going to be a long drawn affair. Uh, investing in a circuit and then getting races there uh, will have to start somewhere, but it will take a bit of time uh, to to make it a success. And you know. People look at motorsports today, they're not just looking at the event per se. They're looking about at all of the other activities and facilities that you have around the circuit. I'll give you a very simple example. People always like to speak about uh, why Singapore F1 is successful. It's successful not just because of it being a night race, it's cooler, but also of all of the other events that they have around that race weekend. It's the weekend that Singaporeans and everybody else don't sleep. There's yeah. concerts, there's clubs, there's all sorts of conferences that it's packaged around a week of motorsports and everything else. So that is important today. So if you want to have a big event, make sure you pack it, pack that weekend with all sorts of, of other things to keep your spectators and your audience occupied. Yeah. That's where you get the return of investment. You don't want somebody who comes in, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, leaves eight o'clock at night, and that's it. You want them to stay eight days, hmm. stay in the hotels, enjoy the F&B, visit other parts of the country. So that's very important. And that can be done not just at SIC, but anywhere else. Hmm. I can give you so many examples. The most recent example that I personally was involved in was the Letap uh, bicycle race in Desaru. The race is just one day, 
4,500 cyclists turned up, yeah. stayed three days, and netted them something like what what 15 million ringgit worth of of FN uh, hospitality business oh. over one weekend. So that's that's a small event which was very successful, well organized. The same can be done for motorsports. Mm. Yeah, true, true. Maybe maybe we need to look into more street races perhaps in in other cities and towns across yes. Malaysia. Are you um yeah, I it definitely needs ha to happen. It all comes down to the biggies though, right? <laughs> the money. Um and it's unfortunate actually speaking about street races, it's unfortunate that we don't have the KL GT race anymore. Um is there anything you can tell us about that? Is there? I, I knew that after that first awesome race, um, and the organizers had proved everyone wrong. Basically, they pulled off something magnificent. Uh, I do know that there was a number of uh, court cases and things for control over over that event. Um, we don't have to get into details about that, but is it possible? Could could we see that happen again? Do you have any inside information you can you can share with us about that? I don't. I don't have any inside information. But then I share. I share your, the same view that you have. You know, having a GT race in in the city, in the middle of the city is very interesting. <clears throat> we we highlight the 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 skyline of the city, the the key um, tourist destinations within the city. And and people being up close and personal with with GT racing is is always attractive, but you know we've also had I think we had Formula E in Putrajaya before, yeah. So th that can come back, and Formula E is always looking for is is designed for cities, mm. with with zero emission, no noise. It's a one day event. You know, this kind of stuff can 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 come back. So we don't have to specifically be in KL in itself. But I'm sure there's other cities which could host uh, a racing series today successfully. But yeah, the, the KLGT weekend was um, was very interesting. I, I remember seeing a bit of it. Yeah, it, I, I had met with the organizers, their offices just across the road, and everyone in the industry was thinking, no, they, they can't pull it off. Um, and I remember it was just a few days before the event there was still huge potholes in the roads and uh, it was so good. And everyone wants that. It was, it was amazing. I think over 350,000 yeah. people were, were lining the streets that weekend. You know, if, if you remember days when the days when we had the formula one weekend and we had Jalan Ampang close just to have formula one cars run up and down that the amount of people who came out to see that, to, to see it, hear it, uh, smell fumes from the car. It was all part of the, you know, the adrenaline, adrenaline rush of of motorsports. So if you know people DBKL can support something like this, having a race in the city, uh, will be very interesting. Yeah, that was Jasmine, Jasmine Jafar. It was the first time he drove the Mercedes Formula One car. Uh, I was doing the PR for that event actually. Ah uh yeah that was that was fantastic and jasmine's actually uh getting heavily involved with um is it, is it, uh, with the mam and and mm. developing malaysian motorsport as well um yes I'm, I'm trying to get him on i mean he's been racing nearly every weekend um but is that is 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 he kind of taking on a role of a, an international ambassador kind of role and trying to connect international entities and events with Malaysia? Well, I think he is uh, indirectly. You know, uh, Jasmine, just like Alex Jung, the icons of Malaysian motorsports, the people who have been around for, for a long time and, and enjoyed various levels of success in motorsports. Jasmine, of course, is still very much uh, involved. Uh, I think he was in Le Mans. Uh, no, not Le Mans. Uh, there was a LMP series, which he was involved in. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, he's also involved in GT racing around the region. Mm. Uh, so he's still very much active. He's on the board of SIC. So, 
Yeah. You know, I'd like to think that he'll keep promoting motorsports because he's still an active participant and people look up to him hmm. as, as what, what can be uh, achieved and a measure of success. So, yeah, we're still very much in touch with him um, to see what he can do with us. And we would need his um, insight, advice um, to, to help promote motorsports, especially when it comes to rules, regulations and, and discipline, because he would be able to tell people, tell the younger generation, I mean, he's, he's not old, but, you know, there's always somebody uh, coming up the ladder that'll be much younger to, to, mm. for them to understand what it takes to, to succeed. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Um, and, and that's got to be another important factor is developing mm. some big names as well, younger talent. And like you said before, try to get them into F3, F2, um, because Jasmine did have a chance for F, well, he was the development driver for the Mercedes yeah. F1 team for a couple of years. Um, what, what's MAM's involvement with the esports aspect of motorsports? Well, we're promoting, you know, we're promoting esports. There are a couple of um, groups that are hosting esports races. Uh, the FIA and FIM are actively telling all of its um, ASNs to promote esports. And we've oh. also seen they, they, they are very serious in esports. Uh, they okay. see it as a very big a new market uh, to be able to develop people, to, to in, encourage kids to get involved in motorsports, be it electric, it's sim racing or come into physical racing. And we've seen that transition happen. Mm -hmm. So in MCS, for instance, or the, the other series in at Sapasa Kid, we've seen sim racers try their hand at actually physically driving a sports car. Uh, uh, so, and and they've, they've done well. So, you know, even if it, we, we can reach a wider audience uh, through eSports and to try and get a bit of that uh, new partic participants into physical racing at the track is, is something we, we have to promote. So we're encouraging it actively. MEM has been involved in several, in several events. Uh, especially during the lockdown period where you couldn't go to the track. I mean, we, we, were, ha we were having races uh, uh, on e-platforms. Mm. Yeah, that was, that was the perfect time to, to get it up mm. and running, really. Yeah, because no one could leave the house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, what, what's in store for the MAM for the future? I mean, we've, we're basically, the industry is basically restarting in Malaysia, uh, now that we're back to normal, I mean, we don't have to scan to go into to shops anymore. Um, do you see the recovery of of local motorsports taking some time, or is the MAM uh, going to be pushing forward hard and fast to 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 get all these other promoters up and running again? Well, you. Uh... I think you're correct on both points. We, we're going to see a lot more organizers come up with plans to, to host their, the series, which they used to do prior to the pandemic. Uh, MAM is also beefing itself up to make sure we can uh, monitor all of these things and help them uh, progress with it. Because you must remember, MAM actually came into being in 2019. And by 2020, everything shut down. Mm. So as 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 the world shut down, literally, we scaled down everything that we needed to do because there was really nothing to do uh, mm -hmm. other than uh, e-racing. So now we're going back up to match what the industry is doing. So we'll be looking at you know uh, the training of our people, the training of the people that are required uh, to to monitor racing, whether it's the stewards, whether it is the the marshals and everything else. So we need to invest in that. To, so that we, we will match what the industry is now saying they're going to be doing. So we don't want to lag. We, we want to be at least at par, if not lead the requirements of the, of the industry. So we are actively doing that. So with, the, with, with FIA regional and FIM regional, uh, we are working towards doing that, getting people trained to handle what is coming. 
Uh, this year, we are already seeing that uh, motorsports is coming back in a strong way, but I expect, fully expect 2023 onwards, we are going to be back to pre-2019 uh, levels. Okay, well, that's only six months away anyway. Yeah, it's and not far. Is, is the MAM a, a, a government agency? Are you, it's not? No. It, it's it's an independent you. body. It is an independent body. Uh, we are, uh, the powers that we have, the ASN uh, powers that we have are uh, uh, awarded to us by the FIA and FIM. It is based on the presentations that we make to them. Right. Uh, of course, we adhere to the rules and regulations of the registrars of societies in Malaysia. What the uh, National Commission of Motorsports requires for us, things, you know, very straightforward things like making sure our finances are in order, whether we are as an association, um, we are having our AGMs uh, annually and those kind of things. Those are very basic uh, requirements of any kind of association in Malaysia so that we do not fall foul of Malaysian laws. But the authority that is given to us to be a regulatory body in Malaysia comes from the FIA and FIM, CIK. So it's just like, you know, the Olympic uh, Council where the, or FIFA, the appointment of the local representative or national individual countries representatives comes from those uh, international bodies. Okay, so do you, do you get funding from any like a sport the sports ministry or or do you have to does the mam have to raise their own funds to to support their projects generally our our fundraising program is from motorsports that means whether it is issuance of license sanctioning of cart uh, tracks and and events but the, the ministries also look at programs that they want to have done in at grassroots level and there they will fund it via SIC and uh, MEM to make sure it is a success. But we are not part of their budgeted uh, entities. Right. Okay, right. Um, actually, you, you just touched on something when you said uh, the issuing of licenses. Uh, one of the one of the Pit Talk Asia subscribers, who's who's uh, quite a well known driver here. Uh, wanted to ask, will the MAM make license renewable more easier online? Because he had to travel some distance from Johor to get to the MAM offices just to renew his racing license. So is the MAM we will, developing more like streamlined yeah, systems? Yeah, we'll be doing all of these things. What we wanted to do also was to have representatives uh, you know, one north, one south, one on the east coast and one in East Malaysia or two in East Malaysia to make all of these things easier. So you don't have to report straight to Kuala Lumpur or do anything, everything through Kuala Lumpur. So whether it is doing things online or having uh, a representative office in the various regions in Malaysia just to facilitate everybody who wants to get involved in motorsports. So all of these things are coming as part of our planning. Great, great. I I, I can't get Passe Gudang out of my head. Um, like you said, it, it's a fantastic circuit there that needs some money spent on it to to get it back to racing level. Now, forgive me, forgive me if I'm out of line here, but you're friends with the Sultan. The Sultan owns it. Can't anything be done? Can't we get him to to open his wallet or something to, to get this moving? <laughs> not, not my place to comment on that, but Pase Gudang has, has got a long history of motorsports and I'd love to see it, it come back uh, to its glory days. Uh, everybody is, is sentimental about Pase Gudang and I'm quite sure if, if it comes back, you will see a lot of events uh, that will be hosted there. The circuit, as I remember it, I've never raced there, but I've driven a Formula, I think it was Formula Ford, if you, if David Sonnenshire can, can remind me what it was, because it was because of him. I was in that car driving around Pasigudang. Oh. Um, and it was a challenging, interesting circuit. I still remember it, blind corners going downhill to the right. 
Um, so yeah, if if Samanese can be found to to refer uh, Pasir Gudang and take it back to its glory days, I I'd love to see it come back on stream. Well, we're all connected to money here and influence. We, <laughs> we just need to uh, do a little bit more pushing, a little bit more harder pushing. Um, yeah, if I had it, actually, then there, there needs to be a study done. I think about uh calculating the costs i don't think that's been done before or it was done maybe six or seven years ago um because it was on again off again but for other i don't know political or whatever reasons that is but yeah if if he is listening uh the sultan we we need to get that passy gudang circuit sorted out so uh just in closing is there Anything uh, that you, anything else you want to share that I may not have touched on about uh, where the MAM's heading or Malaysian motorsport is, is is heading? No, I think I think we've we've covered nearly everything. You know, but but I think the one point that that you raised earlier on about circuits coming up around the country, uh, we've seen a lot of people talk about it. We talk, uh, state governments have have said that they've allocated funds and land. To have these things built, and, and entrepreneurs have said they will build circuits, uh, but it's not yet happened in a big way where we can actually create series that um, go around the nation mm. uh, properly. So I'd like to see that happen, and if there's anything that we can do to facilitate that, uh, not merely everybody keeps thinking that we we are cash rich and and you know able to write out checks uh, to get things done, miracles to happen. That's not quite the case. But where we can uh, lend expertise, um, uh, technical guidance uh, to, to have something built cheap and cheerful and safe, that, that's what we want to do. Because you have to create safe venues to promote motorsports at grassroots levels. And that's, to me, I've always said that grassroots uh, motorsports development is key and that's something MEM and myself personally, that's what we want to focus on. Yeah, true, true. Well, there's 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 plenty of plenty of support. There's plenty of groups here that uh, would like to work with the MAM who are currently working with the MAM. And um, yeah, it's it's just about uh, being on the same page as everyone else yep. and and getting it done. Um, so, uh, Tantri, I, I I really appreciate you giving me some time this morning. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, I'm sure as the as we get closer to 2023 and your your two major programs, the Performance Center and the Talent Development programs uh, grow, uh, I'm sure I'll have you on again so we can explore progress and and things like that. So uh, I'll, I'll keep you on as I finish the recording but uh yeah once again thank you very much for for giving me your time today my pleasure ben anytime thank you hello motorsport fans don't forget to subscribe turn on your notifications and like this video so we can keep the channel going